observational science and historical science, they arbitrarily define science as naturalism and outlaw the supernatural. They present molecules to me and evolution as fact. They are imposing, I believe, the religion of naturalism or atheism on generations of students. You see, I assert that the word science has been hijacked by secularists in teaching evolution to force the religion of naturalism on generations of kids. Secular evolutionists teach that all life developed by natural processes from some primordial form, form, that man is just an evolved animal, which has great bearing on how we view life and death. For instance, as Bill states, It's very hard to accept for many of us that when you die, it's over. But you see, the Bible gives a totally different account of origins, of who we are, where we came from, the meaning of life, and our future. That through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin, but that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whoever believes in him should not perish and have everlasting life. So, is creation a viable model of origins in today's modern scientific era? I say the creation evolution debate is a conflict between two philosophical worldviews based on two different accounts of origins or science beliefs, and creation is the only viable model of historical science confirmed by observational science in today's modern scientific era. And that is time. I have the unenviable job of being the timekeeper here. So I'm like the referee in football that you don't like. But I will periodically, if either one of our debaters runs over on anything, I will stop them in the name of keeping it fair for all. Uh, Mr. Ham, thank you for your comments. Now it's Mr. Nye's turn for a five-minute opening statement. Mr. Nye. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I very much appreciate you including me in your uh, facility here. Now, looking around the room, I think I see just one bow tie. Is that right? Just one. I'm telling you, once you try. Oh, there's, yes, two. That's great. I uh, started wearing bow ties uh, when I was young in high school. My father showed me, his father showed him. And uh, there's a story associated with this, which uh, I find remarkable. My uh, grandfather was in the Rotary, and he uh, attended a convention in Philadelphia. And even in those days, at the turn of the last century, people rented tuxedos. <clears throat> and the tuxedo came with a, a bow tie, untied bow tie. So he didn't know how to tie it, so wasn't sure what to do, but he, he just took a chance. He went to the hotel room next door, knocked on the uh, door, excuse me, can you help me tie my tie? And the guy said, sure, uh, lie down on the bed. So my grandfather, I mean, he wanted to have the tie on, wasn't sure what he was getting into, so he is said to have lain on the bed, and the guy tied a perfect bow tie knot, and quite reasonably, my grandfather said, Thank you. Uh, why'd I have to lie down on the bed? The guy said, I'm an undertaker. <laughs> it's really the only way I know how to do it. Now, that, that, that story was presented to me as a true story. It may or may not be. But it gives you something to think about, and it's certainly uh, something to remember. So here tonight, we're going to have two stories. And uh, we can compare Mr. Ham's story to the story of from what I will call the outside, from mainstream science. The question tonight is, does Ken Ham's creation model hold up? Is it viable? So let me ask you all, what would you be doing if you weren't here tonight? That's right, you'd be home watching CSI. CSI Petersburg. Is that coming? I think it's coming. And on CSI, there is no distinction made between historical science and observational science. These are constructs unique to Mr. Ham. We don't normally have these anywhere in the world except here. Natural laws that applied in the past apply now. That's why they're natural laws. That's why we embrace them. That's how we made all these discoveries that enabled all this remarkable technology. So CSI is a fictional show, but it's based absolutely on real people doing real work. When you go to a crime scene and find evidence, you have clues about the past. And you trust those clues, and you embrace them, and you move forward to convict somebody. Now, Mr. Ham and his followers have this remarkable view of a, a worldwide flood that somehow influenced everything that we observe in nature. A 500-foot wooden boat, eight zookeepers for 14,000 individual animals, every land plant in the world underwater for a full year. I ask us all, is that really reasonable? You'll hear a lot about the Grand Canyon, I imagine, also, which is a remarkable place, and it has fossils. And the fossils in the Grand Canyon are found in layers. 
There is not a single place in the Grand Canyon where the fossils of one type of animal cross over into the fossils of another. In other words, when there was a big flood on the earth, you would expect drowning animals to swim up to a higher level. Not any one of them did, not a single one. If you could find evidence of that, my friends, you could change the world. Now, I just want to remind us all, there are billions of people in the world who are deeply religious, who get enriched, who have a wonderful sense of community from their religion. They worship together, they eat together, they live in their communities and enjoy other company. Billions of people, but these same people do not embrace the extraordinary view that the earth is somehow only 6,000 years old. That is unique. And here's my concern. What keeps the United States ahead, what makes the United States a world leader, is our technology, our new ideas, our innovations. If we continue to eschew science, eschew the process, and try to divide uh, science into observational science and historic science, we are not going to move forward. We will not embrace natural laws. We will not make discoveries. We will not uh, invent and innovate and stay ahead. So if you ask me if Ken Ham's uh, creation model is viable, I say no. It is absolutely not viable. So uh, stay with us over the next period, and you can compare my evidence to his. Thank you all very much. A right. uh, very nice start by both of our 30-minute illustrated presentation to fully offer their case for us to consider. Mr. Ham, you're up. Well, the debate topic was this creation a viable model of origins in today's modern scientific era. And I made this statement at the end of my opening statement. Creation is the only viable model of historical science confirmed by observational science in today's modern scientific era. And I said, what we need to be doing is actually defining our terms, and particularly three terms, science, creation, and evolution. Now, I discussed the meaning of the word science and what is meant by experimental or observational science briefly, and that both creationists and evolutionists can be great scientists, for instance. I mentioned Craig Venter, a biologist, he's an atheist, and he's a great scientist. Uh, he was one of the first researchers to sequence the human genome. I also mentioned Dr. Raymond Damadian, who actually invented the MRI scanner. I want you to meet a biblical creationist who is a scientist and inventor. Hi, my name is Dr. Raymond Damadian. I am a young earth creation scientist and believe that God created the world in six 24-hour days, just as recorded in the book of Genesis. By God's grace and the devoted prayers of my godly mother-in-law, I invented the MRI scanner in 1969. The idea that scientists who believe the earth is 6,000 years old cannot do real science is simply wrong. Well, he's most adamant about that. And actually, he revolutionized. And you know, it, it did occur to me when you had uh, my old friend Larry King up there, you, know, you could have just asked him. He's been around a long time. And, and he's a smart guy. He could probably answer for all of us. Uh, now, uh, let's all be attentive to Mr. Nye as he gives us his 30 minute presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Ham, I, I learned something. Thank you. Well, let's uh, take it back around to uh, the question at hand Does Ken Ham's creation model hold up? Is it viable? So for me, of course, uh, well, take a look. We're here uh, in Kentucky on layer upon layer upon layer of limestone. I stopped at the side of the road today and picked up uh, this piece of limestone that has a fossil right there. Now, in these many, many layers, uh, at, in this vicinity of Kentucky, there are coral animals, uh, zo fossil, zoosanthellae. And the, when you look at it closely, you can see that they lived their entire lives. They, they lived typically 20 years, sometimes more than that, if the water conditions are correct. And so we are standing on millions of, of layers of ancient life. How could those animals have lived their entire life and formed these layers in just 4,000 years? There's not, there isn't enough time since uh, Mr. Ham's flood for this uh, limestone that 
we're standing on to have come into existence. <clears throat> Uh, my scientific colleagues go to places like Greenland, the Arctic, they go to Antarctica, and they drill into the ice with hollow drill bits. It's not that extraordinary. Many of you have probably done it yourselves, uh, drilling other things, uh, hole saws to put locks and doors, for example. And we pull out long cylinders of ice, long ice rods. And these are made of snow. And by long tradition, it's called snow ice. And snow ice forms over the winter as snowflakes uh, fall and are crushed down by subsequent layers. They're crushed together and trapping the little bubbles. And the little bubbles must needs be ancient atmosphere. There's nobody running around with a hypodermic needle squirting ancient atmosphere into the bubbles. And we find certain of these cylinders to have 680,000 layers. 680,000 snow winter, summer cycles. How could it be that just 4,000 years ago, all of this ice formed? Let's just um, run some numbers. Uh, this is uh, some scenes from lovely uh, Antarctic. Uh, let's say we have 680,000 layers of snow ice and 4,000 years since the Great Flood. That would mean we'd need 170 summer, winter, summer cycles every year for the last 4,000 years. I mean, wouldn't someone have noticed that? <laughs> wow, wouldn't someone have noticed that there's been winter, summer, winter, summer 170 times one year? If we go to uh, California, we find enormous stands of bristlecone pines. Some of them are over 6,000 years old, 6,800 years old. There's a famous tree in Sweden, Old Tico, is 9,550 years old. How could these trees be there if there was an enormous flood just 4,000 years ago? You can try this yourself, everybody. Get, I mean, I don't mean to be mean to trees, but get a sapling and put it under water for a year. It will not survive in general, nor will its seeds. They just, they just won't make it. So how could these trees be that old if the Earth is only 4,000 years old? Now, when we go to the Grand Canyon, which is an astonishing place, and I recommend to everybody in the world to someday visit the Grand Canyon, you find layer upon layer of ancient rocks. And if there was this enormous flood that you speak of, wouldn't there have been churning and bubbling and roiling? How would these things have settled out your claim that they settled out in an extraordinary short amount of time is for me not satisfactory. You can look at these rocks, you can look at rocks that are younger, you can go to seashores where there's sand. This is what geologists on the outside do, study what, uh, the rate at which soil is deposited at the end of rivers and deltas, and we can see that it takes a long, long time for sediments to turn to stone. Also, in this picture, you can see where one type of sediment has intruded on another type. Now, if that was uniform, wouldn't we expect it all to be even without intrusion? Furthermore, you can find places in the Grand Canyon where you see an ancient riverbed on that side going to an ancient riverbed on that side, and the Colorado River has cut through it. And by the way, if this great flood drained through, through the Grand Canyon, wouldn't there have been a Grand Canyon on every continent. How could we not have Grand Canyons everywhere if this water drained away in this extraordinary short amount of time, 4,000 years? Now, when you look at these layers carefully, you find these beautiful fossils. And when I say beautiful, I am inspired by them. They're remarkable because we are looking at the past. You find down low, you'll find what you might consider as um, rudimentary sea animals. Up above, you'll find the famous trilobites. Above that, you might find some clams, some oysters. And above that, you'll find some mammals. You never, ever find a higher animal mixed in with a lower one. You never find a lower one trying to swim its way to the higher one. If it all happened in such an extraordinary short amount of time, if this water drained away just like that, wouldn't we expect to see some turbulence? And by the way, Anyone here, really, if you can find one example of that, 
One example of that, anywhere in the world, the scientists of the world challenge you. It, they would embrace you. You would be a hero. You would change the world if you could find one example of that anywhere. People have looked and looked and looked. They have not found a single one. Now, here's an interesting thing. These are fossil skulls that people have found all around the world. It's by no means representative of all the fossil skulls that have been found, but these are all over the place. Now, if you were to look at these, I can assure you not any of them is a gorilla, right? If, as uh, Mr. Hamm and his associates claim, there was just man and then everybody else. There were just humans and all other species. Where would you put modern humans among these skulls? How did all these skulls get all over the earth in these extraordinary fashion? Where would you put us? Well, I can tell you we are on there, and I encourage you, when you go home, to look it up. Now, <clears throat> one of the extraordinary claims associated with uh, Mr. Ham's worldview is that this uh, giant boat, very large wooden ship, went aground safely on a mountain in the Middle East, what we now call the Middle East. And so places like Australia are populated then by animals who somehow managed to get from the Middle East all the way to Australia in the last 4,000 years. Now that to me is an extraordinary claim. We would expect then somewhere between the Middle East and Australia, we would expect to find evidence of kangaroos. We would expect to find uh, some fossils, some bones. In the last 4,000 years, somebody would have been hopping along there and died along the way, and we'd find them. And furthermore, there is a claim that there was a land bridge that allowed these animals to get from Asia all the way to the continent of Australia, and that land bridge has disappeared, has disappeared in the last 4,000 years. No navigator, no diver, no U.S. Navy submarine. No one's ever detected any evidence of this, let alone any fossils of kangaroos. So your expectation is not met. It doesn't seem to hold up. So let's see, if there are 4,000 years since Ken Ham's flood, and let's say, as he said many times, there are 7,000 kinds, today uh, the very, very lowest estimate is that there are about 8.7 million species but a much more reasonable estimate is it's 50 million or even 100 million when you start counting the viruses and the bacteria and all the beetles that must be extant in the tropical rainforest that we haven't found. So we'll take a number which uh, I think is pretty reasonable, 16 million species today, okay? If these came from 7,000 kinds, that's, let's say we have uh, 7,000 subtracted from 15 million, that's 15,993, we have 4,000 years, we have 365 and a quarter days a year. We would expect to find 11 new species every day. So you'd go out into your yard, you wouldn't just find a different bird, a new bird, you'd find a different kind of bird, a whole new species, a bird, every day. A new species of fish, a new species of organisms you can't see, and so on. I mean, this would be enormous news, the last 4,000 years, people would have seen these changes among us. So the Cincinnati Enquirer, I imagine, would carry a column right next to the weather report. Today's new species, and it would list these 11 every day. But we see no evidence of that. There's no evidence of these species. There just simply isn't enough time. Now, as you may know, I uh, was graduated from engineering school, and I, was, I got a job at Boeing. I worked on 747s. Okay, everybody relax. I was very well supervised. Everything's fine. There's a tube in the 747 I kind of think of as my tube. But that aside, I traveled the highways of Washington State quite a bit. I was a young guy. I had a motorcycle. I used to go mountain climbing in Washington State, Oregon. And you can drive along and find these enormous boulders on top of the ground. Enormous rocks, huge, sitting on top of the ground. Now, out there in uh, regular 
uh, academic pursuits, regular geology, people have discovered that there was, used to be a lake in what is now Montana, which we charmingly refer to as Lake Missoula. It's not there now, but the evidence for it, of course, is, if I may, overwhelming. And so an ice dam would form at Lake Missoula, and once in a while it would break. It would build up and break, and there were multiple floods in my old state of Washington State. And but just before we go on, let me just say, go Seahawks. That was very gratifying, very gratifying for me. Anyway, you drive along the road, and there are these rocks. So if, as is asserted here at this uh, facility, that the heavier rocks would sink to the bottom during a flood event, the big rocks, and especially their shape, instead of aerodynamic, the hydrodynamic, the water changing shape uh, as water flows past. You'd expect them to sink to the bottom, but here are these enormous rocks right on the surface, and there's no shortage of them. If you go driving in Washington State or Oregon, they're, uh, they're readily available. So how could those be there if the Earth is just 4,000 years old? How, how could they be there if this one flood caused that? Another uh, remarkable thing I'd like everybody to consider, along inherent in this world view, is that somehow Noah and his family were able to build a wooden ship that would house 14,000 individuals. There are 7,000 kinds, and then and every, there's a boy and a girl for each one of those. So it's about 14,008 people. And these people were unskilled. As far as anybody knows, they had never built a wooden ship before. Furthermore, they had to get all these animals on there, and they had to feed them, and I understand that Mr. Ham has some explanations for that, which I frankly find extraordinary, but uh, uh, this is the premise of the bit. And we can then run a test, a scientific test. People in the early 1900s built an extraordinary large wooden ship, the Wyoming. It was a six-masted schooner, the largest one ever built. It had a motor on it for winching cables and stuff. But this boat had uh, a great difficulty. It was uh, not as big as the Titanic, but it was a very long ship. It would twist in the sea. It would twist this way, this way, and this way. And in all that twisting, it leaked. It leaked like crazy. The crew could not keep the ship dry. And indeed, it eventually foundered and sank a uh, loss of all 14 hands. So there were 14 crewmen aboard a ship built by very, very skilled shipwrights in New England. These guys were the best in the world at wooden shipbuilding. And they couldn't build a boat as big as the ark is claimed to have been. Is that reasonable? Is that possible? That the best shipbuilders in the world couldn't do what uh, eight unskilled people, uh, men and their wives, uh, were able to do? If you visit the... Um, National Zoo in Washington, D.C., it's 163 acres, and they have 400 species. By the way, this picture that you're seeing was taken by spacecraft in space, orbiting the Earth. If you told my grandfather, let alone my father, that we were, had that capability, they would have been amazed. And that capability comes from our fundamental understanding of gravity, of material science, of physics, and life science, where you go looking. These, this place is often, as any zoo, is often deeply concerned and criticized for how it treats its animals. They have 400 species on 163 acres, 66 hectares. Is it reasonable that Noah and his colleagues, his family, were able to maintain 14,000 animals and themselves and feed them aboard a ship that was bigger than anyone's ever been able to build? Now, here's the thing. What we want in science science as practiced out on the outside, is an ability to predict. We want to have a natural law that is so obvious and clear, so well understood, that we can make predictions about what will happen. We can predict that we can put a spacecraft in orbit and take a picture of Washington, D.C. We can predict that if we provide this much room for an elephant, it will live healthily for a certain amount of time. So I. I'll give you an example. In the explanation provided by traditional science 
of how we came to be. We find, as Mr. Hamm alluded to many times in his uh, recent remarks, we find a, a sequence of animals in what generally is called the fossil record. This would be to say when we look at the layers that you find in Kentucky, you look at them carefully, you find a, a sequence of animals, a, a succession. And as one might expect, when you're looking at old records, there's some pieces seem to be missing, a gap. So scientists got to thinking about this. There are lungfish uh, that jump from pond to pond in Florida and end up in people's swimming pools. And there are amphibians, frogs and toads, croaking and carrying on. And so people wondered if there wasn't a, a, a fossil or wonder, a, a, an organism, an animal that had lived that had characteristics of both. People over the years had found that in Canada, there was clearly a fossil marsh, a place that used to be a swamp, had dried out. And they found all kinds of happy swamp fossils there, ferns, so on, and organisms, animals, fish that were recognized. And people realized that if this, with the age of the rocks there, uh, as, as computed by traditional uh, scientists, with the age of the rocks there, this would be a reasonable place to look for an, an animal, a fossil of an animal that lived there. And indeed, scientists found it, Tiktaalik, this fish lizard guy. And they found several sp specimens. There's no, this, it wasn't one individual. In other words, they made a prediction that this animal would be found, and it was found. So far, Mr. Ham and his worldview, the Ken Ham creation model, does not have this capability. It cannot make predictions and uh, show results. Here's an extraordinary one that I find, uh, I find remarkable. There are certain fish, the top minnows, that have the <laughs> remarkable ability <laughs> to have uh, sex with other fish, uh, traditional fish sex, and they can have sex with themselves. Now, one of the old questions in life science, everybody, one of the old sort of chin strokers, is why does any organism, whether you're an ash tree, a sea jelly, a squid, uh, a marmot, why does anybody have sex? I mean, there are more bacteria in your tummy right now than there are humans on Earth. And bacteria, they don't bother with that, man. They just like split themselves in half. They get new bacteria. Like, let's get her done. Let's go. But why does any... Think of all the trouble a rose bush goes to to make a flower and the thorns and, and the, the bees swimming, flying around, interacting. Why does anybody bother with all that? And the answer seems to be your enemies. And your enemies are not lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, no. Your enemies are germs and parasites. That's what's going to get you. Germs and parasites. My first cousin's son died tragically from essentially the flu. This is not some story I heard about. It's my first cousin once removed. Because apparently the virus had the right genes to attack his genes. So when you have sex, you have a new set of genes, you have a new mixture. So people studied these top minnows, and they found that the ones who reproduce sexually had fewer parasites than the ones that reproduced on their own, this black spot disease. Wait, wait, there's more. Uh, in these populations, with flooding and so on, with river ponds get isolated, then they dry up, then the uh, river flows again. In between, some of the fish will have sex with other fish sometimes, and they'll have sex on their own, what's uh, called asexually. Uh, and those fish, the ones that are in between, sometimes this, sometimes that, they have an intermediate number of infections. In other words, the explanation provided by evolution made a prediction. And the prediction is extraordinary and subtle, but there it is. How, how else would you explain it? Uh, and to Mr. Ham and his followers, I say, this is something that we in science want. We want the ability to predict. And your assertion that there's some difference between the natural laws that I use to observe the world today and the natural laws that existed 4,000 years ago is extraordinary and unsettling. I uh, travel around. I have a great many family members in Danville, Virginia, a 
one of the world, one of the U.S.'s most livable cities. It's lovely. And uh, I was driving along, and there was a sign in front of a church, Big Bang Theory, you got to be kidding me, God. Now, everybody, why would someone at the church, a pastor, for example, put that sign up unless he or she didn't believe that the Big Bang was a real thing? I just want to review briefly with everybody why we accept, on, in the outside world, why we accept the Big Bang. Uh, Edwin Hubble, oh sorry, there you go. You gotta be kidding me, God. Edwin Hubble was sitting at Mount Wilson, which is up from Pasadena, California. On a clear day, you can look down and see where the Rose Parade goes. It's, it's that close to civilization. But even uh, in the early 1900s, the people who selected this site for astronomy picked an excellent site. The, the, the clouds and smog are below you. And Edwin Hubble sat there at his, this very big telescope night after night studying the heavens. And he found that the stars are moving apart. The stars are moving apart. And he wasn't sure why, but it was, it was clear that the stars are moving farther and farther apart all the time. So people talked about it for a couple decades. And then eventually uh, another astronomer, almost a couple decades, another astronomer, Fred Hoyle, just remarked, uh, well, it was like there was a big bang. Uh, there was an explosion. This is to say, since everything's moving apart, it's very reasonable that at one time they were all together. And there's a place from whence, or rather whence, these things uh, expanded. And it was a remarkable insight. But people went uh, still questioning it for decades, science and conventional scientists questioning it for decades. Uh, these two researchers wanted to listen for radio signals from space, radio astronomy. And this is, while we have visible light for our eyes, there is a whole other bunch of waves uh, of light that are much longer. The microwaves in your oven are about that long. The radar at the airport is about that long. Your uh, FM radio signals about like this. Uh, AM radio signals are kilometer. There are a couple, several soccer fields. They went out uh, listening, and there was this hiss, this tss, all the time that wouldn't go away. And they thought, oh, doggone it! There's some loose connector. They plugged in the connector. They they rescrewed it. They made it tight. They turned it this way. The hiss was still there. They heard it that way. This is still there. They thought it was pigeon droppings that had affected the reception of this horn, it's called. This thing is still there. It's in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. It's a National Historic Site. And Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson had found this cosmic background sound that was predicted by astronomers. Astronomers running the numbers, doing math, predicted that in the cosmos would be left over this echo, this, this energy from the Big Bang that would be detectable. And they detected it. We built the cosmic observatory for background emissions, the COBE spacecraft, and it matched exactly, exactly the astronomers' predictions. You gotta respect that. It's a wonderful thing. Now, along that line is some interest in the age of the Earth. Right now, it's generally agreed that the Big Bang happened 13.7 billion years ago. What we can do on Earth, uh, these elements that we all know on the periodic table of chemicals, even ones we don't know, are uh, were created when stars explode. And I look like nobody, but I attended a lecture by Hans Bethe, who won a Nobel Prize for discovering the process by which stars create all these elements. The one that uh, interests me especially is our good friends rubidium and strontium. Rubidium becomes strontium spontaneously. It's an interesting thing to me. Uh, a neutron becomes a proton, and it goes up the periodic table. When lava comes out of the ground, molten lava, and it freezes, turns to rock, when the melt solidifies or crystallizes, it locks the rubidium and strontium in place. And so by careful assay, by careful, by being diligent, you can tell how, when the rock froze you can tell how old the rubidium and strontium are, and you can get an age for the Earth. 
When that stuff falls on fossils, you can get a very good idea of how old the fossils are. I encourage you all to go to Nebraska, go to Ashfall State Park, and see the astonishing fossils. It looks like a Hollywood movie. There are rhinoceroses, there are three-toed horses in Nebraska. None of those animals are extant today, and they were buried catastrophically by a volcano in what is now Idaho, is now Yellowstone National Park, what's called the hot spot, people call it the super volcano. And it's a remarkable thing. Apparently, as I can tell you, as a Northwesterner around for Mount St. Helens, I'm, uh, full disclosure, I'm on the Mount St. Helens board, uh, when, it, when it goes off, it gives out a great deal of gas that's toxic and knock these animals out. Looking for relief, they go to a watering hole, and then when the ash comes, they were all buried. It's an extraordinary place. Now, if uh, in the bad old days you had heart problems, they would right away cut you open. Now, we use a drug based on rubidium to look at the inside of your heart without cutting you open. Now, my Kentucky friends, I want you to consider this. Right now, there is no place in the Commonwealth of Kentucky to get a degree in this kind of nuclear medicine, this kind of drugs associated with that. I hope you find that troubling. I hope you're concerned about that. You want scientifically literate students in your commonwealth for a better tomorrow for everybody. You, can, you can't get this here. You have to go out of state. Now, as far as the distance to stars, understand this is very well understood. We, it's February. We look at a star in February. We measure an angle to it. We wait six months. We look at an, that same star again and we measured that angle. It's the same way carpenters built this building. It's the same way surveyors surveyed the land that we're standing on. And so by measuring a distance to a star, you can figure out how far away it is, uh, that star, and then the stars beyond it, and the stars beyond that. There are billions of stars, billions of stars, more than 6,000 light years from here. A light year is a unit of distance, not a unit of time. There are billions of stars. Mr. Ham, how could there be billions of stars more distant than 6,000 years if the world's only 6,000 years old. It's an extraordinary claim. There's another astronomer, Adolf Kattel, who remarked first uh, uh, about the reasonable man. Is it reasonable that we have ice older uh, by a factor of 100 than you claim the Earth is? We have trees that have more tree rings than the Earth is old, that we have rocks with rubidium and strontium and uranium uranium and potassium argon dating that are far, far, far older than you claim the Earth is. Could anybody have built an ark that would sustain the better than any ark anybody was able to build on the Earth? So if you're asking me, and I got the impression you were, is Ken Ham's creation model viable? I, I say no, absolutely not. Now one last thing. You may not know that in the U.S. Constitution, from the Founding Fathers, is the sentence to promote the progress of science and useful arts. Kentucky voters, voters who might be watching online in places like Texas, Tennessee, uh, Oklahoma, Kansas, please, you don't want to raise a generation of science students who don't understand how we know our place in the cosmos, our place in space, who don't understand natural law. We need to innovate to keep the United States where it is in the world. Thank you very much. That's a lot to take in. I hope everybody's holding up well.